epidemiology and biostatistics, as well as our MS program in population health informatics this evening. You're in for a special evening. You'll have the, um, our director of admissions, as well as um, faculty um, from the programs available to um, give you overview, as well as answer some of those more fine-tuned questions about uh, what you can expect um, in applying and you know, should you decide that this is where you would like to pursue your next degree. So again, thank you for coming out on a cold um, early winter night. And um, you know, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Dr. Kudas who will um, tell you more about our admissions process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go right to it. I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of our school. Mm -hmm. So CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, we're a graduate school only. And that means we have graduate programs only. And I know, I've been on my other session, <laughs> hi. Uh, so you're gonna hear a lot of the same information. So we have three doctoral programs, five NPH programs, three MS programs, and some certificate programs as well. They're all on the graduate level, on the graduate level, not on the graduate level. Right, and so this just kind of lists the programs we have. You'll see that there is one uh, program that pertains to this department of epidemiology and biostatistics. Is anyone here interested in the PhD? Okay, good, because it's getting kind of late for the deadline. So, um, but if you have any questions, let me know about the PhD program because we'll be focusing on the programs that are highlighted in red. So the MPH in epidemiology and biostatistics, the MS in population health informatics, and then we also have a certificate in population health informatics. So how many of you are interested in the NPH, EpiBios? Great, most of you. Anyone in the population health? Maybe population health as well? Okay, great. Anyone in the certificate? Okay, very good. So we are an accredited school. We're accredited by Council of Education and Public Health like most other schools of public health, but that means that we're at a, a, you know, a high level of standard for teaching right? and research. We are a very flexible school. We're here for you. How many of you are working? Right, 90% of our students are working either part-time or full-time. Most of them are actually working full-time. They're working, they're taking care of their families, they're doing a lot of other things. So they need a flexible graduate education. And that's exactly what we are here for. We're part of the CUNY family, right? We're a CUNY school. How many of you are familiar with CUNY already? Been to CUNY, have right, seen CUNY. And that's exactly what CUNY is as well, right? It's accessible, accessible to you as working professionals. And that's what we're here for as well. So. You can come to our school full-time, you can come part-time. All our courses are in the evening, anywhere from 4 to 10 p.m. And you'll see here are students right now because that's when our courses are happening. So we have evening courses and online courses as well to make that graduate education possible for you, even though you're working and doing other things in your life, right? 15 out of the 42 credits of the MPH, and it sounds like all of you are interested in the MPH, can be completed entirely online. But they don't have to. If you're not used to online learning and taking courses entirely online, you can take all of those courses in person. On the flip side, however, you cannot complete the MPH entirely online. You have to come to this location, this is our only campus, to complete your MPH degree. But it's flexible. Like I said, a lot of our students are working and most of them are pursuing their MPH part-time. That means it's going to take them a little bit more than the two years for full-time students to complete their degree, and it's usually around three or four years to complete their degree. We offer summer courses, although that's really limited, but we do offer summer courses so that you can, you know, kind of accelerate your career if you want to. Hi there, please sign in. Just kind of a, a quick overview of what the MPH curriculum looks like. So like I said, we have five MPH programs and they all have the same foundation of these five core courses, these 15 credits. Those are the same courses that can be completed online or in person if you want to. So everyone takes these five core courses. And then when you, when you are completed with them or at the same time, you start taking your required coursework for epidemiology and biostatistics. Then you take some electives, you do your 
practice experience and who knows what the practice experience is. That's like the internship. A lot of people call it internship or field work, practicum. It's kind of all the same. The required part of the curriculum is for you to do public health in the real world. So you go out and you get a job somewhere. It could be paid, it could be unpaid, it could be part-time, it could be full-time, it's usually part-time, and you actually do public health. And you get credits for it. I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit. And then you do this thing called a culminating experience where you take everything you've learned and you put it into a project. And that's the NPH curriculum in a nutshell, 42 credits. So again, a little bit more about the field work component. It's 180 hours of service. Students usually do it over a semester, but you can do it over one or two semesters, right? Because again, if you're working, you will have to be doing that as well at the same time. And one of the frequently asked questions I get is, can I do my internship, my field work where I'm currently working? Because I'm working in public health. How many of you are working in public health already? Exactly, most of you are, and that's great. This is gonna definitely help your application. And the answer is you can do your field work at your place of employment, but you can't do it exactly with what you're doing and getting paid for right now. We want you to experience something different. We want you to have your job and have your life, but then do your field work in a little bit different of an area. It could still be working for the same employer, um, but just doing a little bit different of a project. Quick overview of the cost of attendance. We're a CUNY school. That means we're very affordable. I'm sure most of you here are New York State residents. And so our tuition is really, really quite low. Right? We do have funding now to help you with that tuition, but something called the Dean Scholarship, which covers um, a nice percentage of your overall credits, your 42 credits, and then something called the Mayor's Graduate Scholarship, which covers, which gives you a little bit of funding if you work for a New York City agency, like the Department of Health or the Department of Child Services or something like that. So how many of you have already started the SOFIS application? You know about the SOFIS application. So SOFIS stands for, for Schools of Public Health Application System. Most schools of public health in the United States and Canada use SOFIS. And it's like a common app. You go online, you put in your information, your address, your basic information, where you went to school or all that stuff and then you get to apply to different schools and different programs with that same common application. You still have to submit a specific statement of interest to each program and each school that you apply for, because you know they vary and they're quite specific, but it really is kind of like a common application. It's a little bit time consuming, so we recommend that you start, you know, the sooner you start, the better. How many of you are thinking of starting your MPH in the spring semester, spring 2020? Okay, one of you, right? So that spring semester starts at the end of January. The fall semester starts at the end of August. Okay, yes, end of August, correct. And so you'll see here that if you're starting in January, December 1st is the deadline. That's in like two and a half weeks. If you want to start in the fall, you still have a little bit of time. So that's good. Because you'll need that time to like study for those GREs, right? So what are the admission requirements? You need an undergraduate degree. We're a graduate program, we offer graduate courses only, so you need an undergraduate degree with at least a 3.0 or higher. We have had cases of students who have come in with a GPA of less than 3.0, uh, but that means that their GREs or another part of their application has to be really stellar, has to be really good. Two letters of recommendation, and we recommend that at least one of them is from a professor, so it's an academic reference. Now, if I went to graduate school right now, I would not be able to get an academic reference. I've been out of school for a while. And we understand that. A lot of you are working professionals, you haven't been to school in a while, and that's fine. Hopefully your experience will make up for that academic reference. And in that case, you can ask an employer or a colleague to give you a letter of recommendation. Someone that really can speak to how well you would be doing in graduate school. Are you going to be successful in graduate school setting? For resume, Pretty much everyone has a resume. Statement of purpose, very important. So I would say that the, the two or three 
most important part of the applicant parts of the application are your grades, obviously very important. Your GREs for this program, we're gonna talk about this in a minute, but your statement of purpose, because that statement of purpose is going to tell our admissions committee why you wanna do public health, what you're going to do with your MPH when you finally get it, what motivated you to come into graduate school and work on that MPH, your kind of passion for public health. Talk about your experience definitely in public health. I know about a lot of you have already are doing public health right now. That's huge. Definitely talk about that. And the internships, anything that relates to public health. And in this case, epidemiology and biostatistics, right? Specifically. Data, math, statistics, anything like that. So and so that's that part of experience. And now the GREs. Epidemiology and biostatistics within our school is really the only program that requires requires the GREs. There are some exceptions. If, for example, you already have another master's in like a related field like statistics, <laughs> or if you are a medical doctor, if you have a PhD and you want to now get an MPH in biostatistics, you probably would not have to take the GREs. But come speak with me and I'll, I'll be able to kind of advise you on whether or not those GREs would be waived. They're on a case by case basis. And most of you will have to take the GREs. How many of you have taken them already? Oh, great. Okay, so a couple of you. We recommend that study for the GREs for about three to four months. Not every day, not full time, 40 hours a week. That would be uh, a little too much. But that you really go through those practice exams, that you really know what to expect. The quantitative portion of the GREs is going to be very important for this program, right? It's very quantitative in nature already. You have to have that base and understanding of math and science and statistics. Um, so definitely focus on the quantitative portion, but don't disregard the other portions as well, because there's still going to be a fair amount of writing and a fair amount of analytical work that goes into um, courses within that program. Does anyone have any questions so far? Mm -hmm. um, so are there any, like uh, you mentioned, so, um, Dr. Shang Lee is going to talk about epidemiology and biostatistics, and we can talk about that okay. when, when we have that separate session. Um, there, are, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a little bit. There are, um, but they're not very like specific. It's not like you have to have calculus one and only calculus one, right? There's definitely evidence of you having quantitative understanding, and that could be proven in a variety of different ways, right? Exactly. Anyone else? Questions? And TOEFL, if um, your degree was not in English, your undergraduate degree, so that's if applicable. And that is for me. I know I went through this really quickly. Yeah, go ahead. What was, because it said state of purpose and then experience, what's the difference between those? We just like to see experience. It's it's going to be within that statement of purpose. There is a section actually in the Surface application that has an experience section. I like to put it up there because I want to make sure that you, you as applicants really focus on your public health experience. We have students who apply to our NPH program and who have 20 years of experience. It's not exactly in public health. So if you could somehow tease out all of the experience that you've had and you know, kind of relate it to public health show that in your resume, then that would be great. You you might have to tweak your resume a little bit to show that it really favors public health or, or math or statistics in this case, right? Epidemiology and biostatistics. Great questions. Anyone else? No? Okay. I'm sure you'll have more questions a little bit later. And a question from Facebook? Oh, no, no. Yeah. We're recording this session. Okay. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Lee, who's going to talk a little bit more about the specific department of epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, good, good night, so welcome. Uh, so my name is Sean Lee. I'm a assistant professor in epidemiology. So, so I'm so glad to see you, especially today. It's probably I say I said it's the you know, the first like, cold night <laughs> this year. Um, uh, so, so I will briefly talk about a little bit of the program epidemiology, uh, the department. So then, um, so 
I'm more open to you know different various uh, questions you might have. So I personally, I think uh, I'm the primary person to deal with automation. So uh, if you really apply for the IP, so um, I usually will be the person to review all the applications. So like the uh, question you might have, so we can discuss. Uh, um, epidemiology, so basically what we do, so in epidemiology biostatistics, biostatistics field, so we train students to learn research method, advanced research method. So use statistics as the research tool. So the third purpose usually we tell students, you know, teach them how to apply to our research you know, outcomes to yield in the field, to promote, improve public health. So this is for public health. So our research is usually at population level. So uh, we want to apply our research outcome to do population level interventions. Oops. So a little bit more. Um, in, in the department, so we have two tracks. So here we have two, uh, so AP track and the biostatistics track. So in AP, epidemiology, if you want to be an epidemiologist, usually we focus on more study design. So you learn different study design method. So you learn how to design a study, contact a study, implement the study in the field, how to collect data, clean the data, so all that type of thing. So if you want to focus on more statistics, so what we teach students, you know, to become a statistician. So after we collect data from field. So statistician will clean the data to you know, store the data, think about, the, observe, understand the um, features of the data, how to pick the right statistical method to analyze in the correct way. So that's stat the statistician will, will do. Um, you know, we have various class courses, for example, so epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, your students, many of us, uh, some of you already working in public house. Some of uh, usually we saw students come here, they want to switch their career track to so public health epidemiology. So what's their career or job market in future? So overall, so our um, response from students, majority of our, our students will find a job. And many of our students, if they're from, not from New York area, from other area, so they, they come here, so one really important benefit is you know, in New York, they learn, they have the opportunity to take great field, of, field work, so they have opportunity to get a job. So this is, um, I, I see it's really a plus in the urban region. Um, usually our students go uh, work with uh, in government agency, work in public health organization. So um, because New York City has so many research institutes, big hospitals, so uh, many of our students um, finally got a job in research, you know, in those um, hospitals, schools, and uh, uh, also, even they go to commercial companies. So now many companies do you know doing their own business with uh, a little bit of contact with health. So those are area variety area career track students will go. So um, During your um, MPH learning, so you will take totally 45 credits. So about this, so you will first take all five we call B 
basic or core course for any MPH students from different, from other department and also from AP department, AP Bar State department. So after you take the five basic class, you go to, to the, we call the AP or BioStat require the five method class. So we call, you know, biostatistics master one, master two, epidemiology is master <coughs> one, master two. Those are from um, basic to advanced res research method. So bas basically our idea is after you took those course, it's uh, you will be cap capable to do the uh, common stu study design and data analysis in your research setting. So you also will take a class to data management and really give you a chance to work with faculty in the class to do a course project from you know, data cleaning to data analysis, then write a report. So after you take the five required courses, so you have a chance to take three selective courses, so based on your interest. For example, so this uh, next semester, so we provide eight different selective classes. You can choose from, uh, we have advanced epidemiology class, method class, we have advanced statistical master class. So I will be teaching system science and system modeling and also cover machine learning. So nowadays, you know, uh, so big data analysis if is very uh, common used in various area, also in public health. So uh, in my uh, class, I will teach, you know, the big data analysis and teach system science, system modeling. Um, so we also have GIS. So if some of you, um, you know, like the how to do the spatial tempo analysis, we create you know, fancy, you know, in my research, I also do spatial analysis, create fancy maps. Um, so after this, all the you know the coursework in the class. So after that, the mention you you have two calls to you know, do the practical learning. So the first one credits is what we call field work. So usually, uh, you know, many students work in department house. So CUNY school public house. So. Um, it's probably the only uh, public health program has the closest relationship connection with the department of health, the city department of health. So I'm, I'm myself personally as a consultant for the department of health. So I visit there every month. So work with them, analyze department of health data, work on different projects. So the students go to the one house, go to hospital, and you know, go to other settings to do a field work. Um, so this is more practical. So after that, you have two credits. So here we want you to finish a master level, so research project, we also call capstone project. So, um, so usually each year, uh, you can, students can work with researchers in other schools, other institute, and uh, like our faculty members usually direct two or three. So each year usually I have two or three students work with me on my research project. So they will take, you know, so this, they will take, uh, enjoy this class working on a project for a semester. So finally, finally uh, you know, have a report. Ideally, we want to have the report in publishable format. Uh, so, for example, we have a student um, uh, 
she, he's from Argentina, so he worked with me on a spatial analysis. Uh, so, so we already you know, submitted the, to the journal. He's now starting doing doctoral program so in NYU. Uh, so the research project so here give you the chance um, help you apply your you know the skill you learned and also develop a basis if you want to continue advanced training. So this uh, um, the courses class usually you will take during the MPH time. So besides you know the uh, AP biostat. So in our department, so uh, we also closely link to our institute. It's called uh, Institute for Implementation Science in Population House. So because um, so it's uh, led by a professor in epidemiology. So uh, Dennis. So Dennis Nash is a. Uh, infectious disease epidemiologist. So in our department, his research area is um, HIV. So, and now also extend to other research. So he's one of the famous uh, HIV public health researchers. Uh, he brought in, he is leading a big group, a big center uh, to focus on uh, research, you know, how to translate say, academic research to implement the real publishing intervention. Uh, so one project I'm working with him is, so we look at the international HIV case um, huge data set. So we, we are uh, planning to do the machine learning, try to understand uh, so especially in African countries, so um, maybe what factors really influence people have good treatment results or you know not that good treatment result. So we also look at you know the from the um, clim climate, so weather climate, even to how people behavior of HIV treatment, all those type of things. Um, so. This are you know a big institute or center. Um, so many students have, so will have a chance to work there, say um, as research assistant or finish their capstone project. Or uh, many of our doctoral students are uh, working in the center. Uh, we also have um, the bioinformatics program. It's uh, basically it's it's led by um, Levi. So Levi is a biostatistician. Um, he do the bioinformatics. So he has a, a few projects looking at um, genes data, analyze genes data. So um, try to understand the risk factors related to cancer or some infections. This is a research example. So um, the department we have now, we have uh, 13 faculty members. So this is all, all of us. So, um, so uh, Professor um, Luisa Burroughs is currently the chair. Uh, so Heidi is the doctoral program director. So um, she's handling the doctoral training. Uh, yeah, this um, Dennis. Dennis is uh, leading the institute, implementation institute, uh, Levi. Um, uh, Ashish uh, is the associate dean, and he's, um, he's the, also the director of public health, health informatics. So this, uh, this is some of our faculty members. So, I think that's the very basics. Um, I was told maybe, you know, before 
answer your questions, I briefly talk about my background, you know, with epidemiology, but public health. So um, maybe give you some idea, you know, how I choose epidemiology. So um, you might can guess I was originally from China. So I was trained in uh, medical school with a medical degree. So after after that, um, so I I shortly working um, hospital. I work for government. So like I work for Shanghai the city department house, like here the department house. So I was doing the outbreak control. So I led a, a group of people um, to doing the infectious disease surveillance and uh, outbreak control. So in developing countries, not like the here, so uh, you can think about all type of foodborne disease, waterborne disease, we come out, go to the field. So uh, the difference is here, public health, we probably focus on um, a little bit less in medicine. In developing countries, sometimes one more time, when I handle public health, so we handle both public health and also sometimes even brought med medicine with you. So because you know in the field sometimes you need to treat so the, the patient as in outbreak settings. So uh, one example my I can mention the SARS everyone learns still memorize the SARS outbreak, right? So the SARS outbreak actually uh, in Shanghai area so um, it's, it was um, the team I led, so we deal with the SAS, so um, survey, so handle the public health part. So the hospital, specifically the, ho the infectious disease hospital, the doctors, so with public health, you know, people like our, we call our infectious disease epidemiologists, work together to handle the SARS outbreak. So, I also, my research area, uh, so uh, I was trained in uh, epidemiology. Epidemiology is based on, so usually commonly based on statistics. So uh, beyond that, I also was trained in, we call now, called system science. So the new method designed by Council of Public Health Education so traditionally, we focus on statistics, statistical method. So now we extend to both statistics, qualitative method, and the system modeling, system science. System science means network model. You might list, you know, here the term network models. So, so agent-based simulations. So. OD-based compartmental transmission, transmission models. Those are all so called by NIH called system modeling, system science. So for example, one project we work with students and also work with computer scientists is, so we create a GIS-based so disease simulation for obesity in New York City. So which means in the, in the model, we have each individual so we create synthetic population. We have eight million people. So in the model, so we give them their gender, age, their disease status, their daily life, go to work, go to school. So we put necessary uh, characteristics with um, put it all together to discuss how intervention might as a theoretical test there how intervention might change disease at population level. So that's um, that's something about the department, about myself. So um, I can quickly answer questions you have about administration and uh, the department. Yeah. So you mentioned the case cancer genomics grant. Is yeah. that only with the um, population health, the online master's so, yeah or can you do it in the epi bio track so there's two uh, you know the two term two actually it's two degree two 
two directions when I talk about art. So Levi's direction we call bioinformatics. So it's using statistics to analyze genetic data. So that's more for more uh, on the um, it's on the biostatistics. So the public health public health informatics will present you know, a good. So in the next presentation, we'll talk about that. That's a little bit different from the bioinformatics. So which one are you? Well, I'm thinking of both. Oh, right. right. So, <laughs> both. so the genetics, but you're saying the genetics one is in EpiBio or it's in the other one? Yeah, so, EpiBio. Biostatistics. EpiBio. Okay. All right. But you can do research with any faculty, regardless of what you're actually studying, right? Um, and, you know, our faculty are doing research, like Dr. Lee said, in so many different levels in so many different areas. And they're always looking for research assistants, right? When you're doing research, you gotta do all the grunt work, you gotta collect the data, you're gonna analyze the data, you gotta like, you know, do all the <laughs> data analysis and stuff like that. And so they're always looking for research assistants. And you don't have to be specifically studying epidemiology by statistics to be working with Dr. Lee, for example, or, or Levi, right, <coughs> on those areas if you if you have the background and if you have the qualifications to help him in his research studies. We have people working with faculty from epidemiology by statistics who are studying community health. You know, so if that's kind of what you're you're asking about. Um, so then would I have to have a history with genetics to get? That depends on what, what he needs help with. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of help his projects needs. Sometimes it's literally data entry, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's actually analyzing data. Um, so the answer is not necessarily, not necessarily. So in Diva's case, uh, so sometimes also myself, so because that's a, um, you know, a, a direction some students like, he set up the uh, so learning program. So just uh, any students just go there, so um, they reading papers, reading book chapters, so for a few weeks, uh, for a semester, you know, some students become very interested in his area, so then, become a research assistant for him. So can we work with him for you know, one year or even longer? Yeah. Yes. So I had a question. Um, so I work for the Department of Health. And yeah. in my bureau, we have a lot of research projects that we would like to get to, but we can't. So if for like, say, for my capsule, I wanted to focus, because um, I'm in tuberculosis, so I want to focus yeah. the area of TB that I very interested in researching. Would that be okay? Would it be having something outside of tuberculosis because I work in TV? So uh, you say here, so for the last two, uh, so the one period is we also call field work. So for field work, we hope you don't do that, the TV in your field. For the two credits, the chemistry project, a research project. So of course you can work on your field, but not. So we usually will probably will will discuss with you. So to help you, you know, make this in a project that's maybe a little bit beyond your daily work. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just want to. Follow up again. Um, is there any like uh, quantitative course requirements for the Tradition? Yeah. So we we don't have specific requirement to any specific course. You know, mass class required. But you know, while I do the review, admission, administration, or uh, so I really look at you know the GIE, so the quantitative part. So if that's good, you know, I will ha feel happy. If not, I will go back to look at your undergraduate, the math class or statistic class. So, you know, I try to get evidence. So at least, um, you know, it's usually epidemiology about statistics. It's, um, it's in the quantitative research side. So we hope the students have the basic um, so the mass or number science, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say um, 
majority of stu students who apply, so they are uh, they are qualified. So, um, so we are not math department. So we we are not statistic department. So we are you know bio statistic in the public health. So um, so basically you know don't be so scared of math. So but we want a little bit of evidence to show you can deal with numbers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll have time to for questions later um, at the end, or if you want to do it offline after we're done with the presentation portion, come up to me or Dr. Lee or um, Chioma, and you know we have to answer any questions you have. Okay, so next up is Chioma Amadi. She's going to talk to you about the population health informatics um, MS program. Take it away. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Chama Amadi and I'll be talking to you about the MS program in population health informatics. Um, I'm a research associate in population health informatics. I'm also a doctoral student in epidemiology and I teach the online certificate program in population health informatics here at CUNY. So just a brief overview of population health informatics. Some of you may or may not be familiar with this. So population health informatics basically involves the application of technology in delivering public health interventions. So in designing, developing, or implementing these interventions. Now the key word informatics there is basically the science of making data meaningful. And that basically entails um, deriving evidence-based solutions that can address public health challenges. And as public health professionals, that's really what we aspire towards achieving, right? So the key distinction between informatics, the discipline of informatics and other related public health disciplines is the application of technology as a channel to drive public health interventions. So population health informatics uh, differs from, uh, it's a relatively new discipline. It's different from the more familiar discipline of public health informatics, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, because population health informatics extends beyond the governmental context of public health. So the approach is more um, geared towards integrating clinical care with social determinants of health at a more broader level to make holistic decisions. So that's essentially, in a nutshell, what it entails. So the MS program in population health informatics uh, requires a total of 39 credits. That includes 15 credits of core coursework, and that's basically the MPH courses you just went through. And then we have required coursework of 18 credits that are specific to the program. So work um, coursework in population health informatics fundamentals, principles of consumer health informatics, applications. So everything from basically designing these innovations, implementing them, evaluating them, and then looking at specific examples like um, innovative uh, technologies in population health, like population health dashboards, use of mobile health devices, and maybe data collection or um, research studies and more. And uh, we have some of those ongoing projects here, which I'm going to go over a little bit. And then we have elective coursework of six credits, and then a practice and community experience of six credits. So that gives you the total 39 credits. So why would you pursue an MS uh, degree in population health informatics? Uh, basically, there's been a rapid increase in the informatics jobs uh, in the past decade, and there's a projected increase of about a growth uh, rate of about 13% um, beyond uh, the present decade. And um, essentially, informatics jobs are high paying. The average annual salary is around 92,000, uh, with a projected growth of 23% by 2022. And overall, there's been an increased funding for informatics programs across schools and, you know, programs of public health in the United States. And generally, there's a growing need for informatics professionals across departments of health. So you're in the right place. So these are some of the ongoing projects that we have uh, here as part of our MS program, you know, for our students to basically engage in maybe for their practice work or, you know, just... Uh, it's part of the experience. So in the US, we have local projects as well as global projects. Some of the local projects include a smart well-being dashboard. This is a population health dashboard that was designed to monitor the well-being of mental health first aid workers in New York City. And the idea is to improve mental health service delivery. 
And we also have another dashboard known as the Ending the Epidemic Dashboard. Uh, it's a project of Governor Cuomo to end the HIV epidemic by 2020. And essentially this dashboard uh, collates data from across New York, um, New York City hospitals. So data from uh, identifying or diagnosed HIV cases to linking them to care, retention in care and pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this dashboard essentially collates all of that information to inform evidence-based decisions. And then in the global settings, we also have projects like uh, road traffic injury surveillance data that's in India, um, a human-centered dietary decision support system for diabetic patients. And currently we're mapping the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, across urban slum settings, basically to see where they're achieved, where there's lacking, you know, and then what needs to be done to improve uptake. So what can you do with an MS degree in PHI? Essentially, there's a wealth of career opportunities, not limited to being an informatics researcher, health technology analyst, uh, an IT manager in the healthcare field, an informatics consultant, a digital health manager, information officer, or even a health data standards leads. And this is just um, a bunch of so many other opportunities out there. And there's also a number of possible employers. Of course, healthcare and technology consulting firms, departments of health, um, IT companies, IT startups, uh, public health agencies at the local, state, and national level, hospitals, clinics, and other healthcare settings, insurance, research and development in population health informatics, pharmaceutical companies, as well as universities. So, yeah, thank you. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I guess maybe mm -hmm. discuss the difference between the public health informatics and the order of the bioinformatics. Like she just mentioned. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's basically that's kind of like the, the scope of public health informatics is more population based versus bioinformatics that may be more focused on clinical clinical health data for instance. So population health informatics essentially integrates social determinants of health. So if you think about conditions in which people live, in which people are born, versus what is just going on in your body, for instance, with the genes and the genome and interaction with drugs and things like that. So population health informatics is basically more broader. If I understand it, public health informatics, the Ashish here is more focused on application of um, Technology yeah. and uh, the computer science based uh, technology and other things to solve health problems. Exactly. So, the bio bioinformatics, so usually, so in uh, biology or in medical school, so when you hear bioinformatics, basically, folks on, so your statistical method analyze genetic related data. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys have been on our website. It's probably how you found us, maybe through other channels. But one thing I wanted to show you, obviously, you know, the website has a wealth of information, admissions, admissions events. You're in one of them. Mission requirements, obviously, very important. You are asking very good questions about the math requirements and, and what's, you know, what's the minimum. But the one area that I want you to focus on as well is this research part of it. Because if you go to the centers and institutes, you'll see kind of a spectrum of the different research areas that our faculty here in public health are engaged in. So there's the Urban Food Policy Institute, the Institute for Impl Implementation Science and Population Health, right? That's the one that Dennis Nash um, has. And there's, you know, a bunch of other ones, global health, refugee and migrant health, right? kind of a different area of public health, but obviously very public health related. So just go kind of through them and click on some of them to learn about the different research that's happening here that might be of interest to you. It sounds like you obviously have a specific interest in public health. Um, and so just going through them might be useful because especially, like I said, our faculty are doing research in all these areas and they need you. They need students to help them with that research. And it's a great way to get into public health and to have that on your resume at the same time. You have an office of career services helps you find a job after you graduate, obviously. Um, and they can they also post advertisements for different positions that are available either, you know, at the Department of Health or here within the CUNY School of Public Health that our faculty are looking for um, help as well. Okay. 
Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry that I missed miss out the first part when you talk about like stop. Yeah, so that's I okay. have some questions. The first question is that like which one do you wait more on um, like GPA? Uh, I believe you maybe you can answer it. <laughs> so, uh, he, he's <laughs> actually going to review the application. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so, for example, if uh, I review, I handle the epidemiology of the institution. Mm -hmm. So, uh, usually, what I focus on, we have uh, you know uh, a list of criteria that we will look at. That. But for myself, I really like. Um, the people in your whole package, I can show um, why you want to switch to public health. You know, the link of public health epidemiology. So there I can, I want to see a, a little bit evidence. Uh, so you are a person, you can handle um, quantitative things. Uh, then another thing, I would, you know, I say something I don't want to say as um, so. Most most students, uh, so I I I I like you know they have not say because they work in current, so they work in public house or. So I want to say they can, they can talk her story. So here, so the public health epidemiology about statistics, so it makes sense for them. Either they start a new career or switch their career. So they have reasonable um, so decision. So, so then I basically tell me, okay, so this is you know, the, the one come here. So they actually have the motivation, can finish, so based on you know the, those reasons. The second, uh, so if some students really have poor, uh, say for example undergraduates, so the quantitative math, bio statistics part of performance. So I would say if uh, I would suggest those students to work a little bit more on GIE. So then you can spend a little bit longer time to make sure you have uh, you know, at least a better uh, score in GIE mathematics part. Um, or, or you know, explain yourself in a, in a natural way. So you, know, you want to do public health, you want to do epidemiology. And uh, also, you understand you know, epidemiology. So I see recommend, I see the letters, um, so the, the, the statement. So if I say they understand epidemiology, they understand public health, you know, that's really usually I say all oh, this doesn't. So some some students even they applied it, but they are not, really not, not sure to so what they, they they are going to do. Epidemiology is about you know, study design. It's design research. So conduct implement research. So then come back, analyze your data, research data, right? So that's a, that's in what you will learn in school. So when you go out, so you can do various things. So basically, as I always said, link to epidemiology, link to public health, and uh, quantitative background. That probably the things you are right, see. Yeah. Also for the GRE, right? Like, do you care like how many times a student took it? No. That's so, <laughs> yeah, some people say they do, but uh, uh, most time we really to say you know the the positive side. If you GRE is good, say, or if you undergraduate math background is good. So if your last you took three times GIE, the last one was good. So anything good will pick up that point. And what's the is there like a minimum like number of GIE that you want to take? Like you said, 
So there's uh, um, suggestion, say, that average three point zero. So, uh, so we, we should, that is based on we look at your background, we look at your health related background, we look at your you know, undergraduate academic performance, we look at your GIE, we look at your statement, your uh, recommendation letters, all together. So the best will be the four points will be four. So then we ideally want, we want to pick up the students with average at three. But uh, you know, just as I mentioned, usually I see the students really, they are good at academic performance. All oh, that students are really, you know, have close link to public health epidemiology. So, you know, one side, you are not that good. You have two, you got two points for GIE but you got a very strong recommendation letter, so we'll balance. There's no, there's no minimum. The better you do, the better for you. Yeah, yeah. That's what I say. <laughs> so for the recommendation letter, like who, like who can we write it for the us? Like, can it be, like, what are the teachers and professors or like someone from the work would be able to get something? I think Mary mentioned, I think she's right. So uh, she's, she's correct. I mean, if you are just graduated from um, just uh, finish your undergrad, so you might uh, you know, ask about professors. So if you you are working, you might ask you know, your boss or um, you know, some of you working a research setting, you might ask your um, research uh, colleagues. So, um, Usually, I see students, um, or we suggest students, say if you have two letters, one from maybe, uh, say usually, you say you get from administrative people. So then another one, you know, in some way, if you can have someone link to the academic research, so it will be better. So if, if you, you couldn't, you just get three from your colleagues. So say, um, yeah. you, you, at least so, uh, I remember the requirement is three, uh, but you, you, at least you should have two. So like, if I tell my professor to write a recommendation letter, does it need to be, does like, did that professor need to be like half related, like like what he teaches and yeah. so what it needs to be? Yeah, so, in, in, um, so far, so when they submit recommendation letter, so they will provide information how long they know the student. Mm -hmm. So that you know when we read the letter, we do sometimes um, pay attention to that. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry, my last question. So for for practicing for the GRE, right? Like is there any book that you recommend us to review some learning and then practice on before going to if the real one? Because from from what I know I mean, I know that there's like Kipman and Princeton. I don't know what's out there. I haven't really done much research on it, so I'm not sure if there's any better one out there. So I'll, I'll answer that. So ETS is um, the company that administers the GREs, the TOEFL, you know, a bunch of other tasks, right? And you go on the website and you see the products that they have. You can take a test. You can take an exam. Uh, I'm sorry. You can take a course to prepare for the exam. It might cost you. There are free resources. There are practice exams here on their website um, that are free, or you can buy a whole book that will give you a bunch of practice exams. It's kind of like the SATs, right? If you if you took those, you know, it depends which way you go. Um, I wouldn't stress about it so much if you already have a foundation in in math, right, in quantitative sciences, or if you've already a pretty good student. GREs, you know, they, they just word things kind of weirdly sometimes. The questions are not necessarily difficult. They're not going to ask you to, you know, calculus two questions. <laughs> They're not that advanced, but you probably haven't seen those equations since you were a junior in high school or something. You know, you just you haven't had that. You haven't done that in real life. Most people do that, don't do that type of math in real life. So just making sure that you're familiar with what the question is asking that you're used to you know, the format of the GREs. Um, but plenty of resources available on the ETS website. And like you say, Princeton Review, I mean, all those other, it's up to you. I don't recommend one over the other. What I recommend is 
definitely preparing for the GRS. Yeah. Good question. Yes. Um, so just, just like you said, if you're already a good, you, know, uh, you have a very good undergraduate um, score. So for example, you have uh, say a GPA 3.5. So uh, honestly, the GRE, you don't need to pay. So when we, we look at your undergraduate score, we know you're a good student. The GRE, so you, you just try your best. So if you, if your undergraduate you know, background in some way is not that good, so, so you probably prepare for GIE can help you so in, on your other side. That's something I will, like, basically that's the point. Yeah. Do you average, so if you went to like different schools or you have different degrees, like I have an associate's and a bachelor's. So are you gonna average, take an average of both or how is that gonna be factored? Uh, that's very interesting. So when you report, the system will report uh, uh, average GPA for each school. So they have an overall average for all the school together. So, um, so for us, we will look at both you know, average GPA and also you know, sometimes we'll pay uh, not too much you know, we do really you know, look at which school you graduate. Uh, so we know, uh, you know some schools are a little bit different. So, but generally, it's still the overall uh, summarize the average is the okay. key. Yeah. So, so this the service application creates GPAs, various different types of GPAs. You undergrad GPA, you graduate GPA. Your first school GPA, second school GPA, you combine total GPA, your math and science GPA, your social sciences GPA. So there's different ways of looking at your GPA depending on which program you're applying. We have students who apply to EpiBias, but they're also applying to community health. The, the admissions committees from those two programs are going to look at those GPAs differently, right? EpiBias is definitely going to look at the math and science, but the community health people are going to look more on the social sciences GPA. Yeah, regarding this, I remember so many of our, some of our applicants. So if they are first year, second year in the undergrad, so the score is not that good. So maybe in the third year, junior, um, in the senior year, they become much better. So they actually mentioned, so in their statement or mentioned, so I remember in the application, there's some area. So they can make notice. So we really, we pick up those we have those cases each year, so we pick up. So if it's first year um, freshman, their mass was not good, but uh, in the third year, fourth year, so they become very good. So that's also uh, you know, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Come see me if you have any other questions. Um, we probably have our emails, admissions at sphsecurity.edu. It's in, over, all over our website. It's uh, all over the materials you have there as well. And you can always contact us. You can come in and, and we'll walk you through the application. It could be a little overwhelming. We'll sit with you. We'll give you a computer and we'll sit with you and go through each one of the, the sections of the application if, if that's what you want. We won't write the statement for you, but we can, you know, maybe give you some pointers and stuff like that. What we recommend is that for your personal statement, when you write it, give it to your mother, give it to your sister, give it to your girlfriend, your brother, whoever, someone else who isn't you to look at, to make sure that it makes sense to them, to make sure that it reads nicely. Because in addition for it, to it being a personal statement that talks about your passion for public health, what are you gonna do with this NPH and epidemiology and biostatistics? It actually also serves as your writing sample. Make sure it's well written. And sometimes when we're really writing and concentrating on something so much, you can't really step away and see like it's very, you know, easy, easy mistakes. Someone else who's going to read it and be like, oh, that sentence doesn't flow. It doesn't make sense. So make sure you do that as well. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.